Hello and welcome to Buford Presbyterian Church. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us here for worship. As we prepare our hearts and minds to worship the living God, I invite you to join with me in the call to worship from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Let us call ourselves to worship together, saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And now, please join with me as we sing our hymn, Live into Hope. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who walk in God's ways. We come to this time of confession seeking to walk in God's ways, aware that we often take other paths that do not lead to abundant life. We trust God's mercy and promise to forgive as we name aloud the ways in which we have fallen short and failed to follow Jesus Christ. Friends, let us pray together. Lord, you search our hearts and see the places where we are hardened and resistant to your will. In this time of much upheaval and pain, we frequently turn away from those in need, seeking our own security instead of the well-being of all creation. We let petty differences separate us from one another. We allow self-interest to overwhelm your commandment to love our neighbors. We fail to see your image evident in every person. Forgive us, we pray, and in your mercy redirect us so that we can once again walk in your ways. Amen. 
Amen. Who will bring any charge against God's people? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, and who is at the right hand of God, who, inter- who indeed intercedes for us. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God, and amen. Good morning, friends. I sure hope you've had a great week and are doing well this morning. In just a few minutes, we will hear Pastor Davis read our scripture passage for the morning. And today's passage has some very special stories called parables. Parables were stories Jesus told to help us understand who God is and what God's kingdom is like. And I wonder what you think. What do you think God is like? What do you think God's kingdom is like? Jesus helped his disciples and followers and he helps us get to know God better by telling us these stories, these parables. Each parable Jesus told gives us a little picture of what God and God's kingdom are truly like. And as we begin to put them all together, these glimpses, then we get a better and better understanding of who God is. In the parables we'll hear today, Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed and some yeast. It may seem odd, I know, but I think the key to understanding these parables and understanding God better is not to focus on the item or the object itself, but on what people do with them. So let's talk about the mustard seed first. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? It's tiny, the tiniest of seeds, Jesus says. But what happens to a seed? Mustard seeds, like all seeds, are meant to be planted. And when it is planted, it grows and grows and becomes a tree big enough for birds to nest in its branches. The mustard seed reminds us that even the smallest things can make a huge difference in the world. Just like a huge tree can grow from an itty bitty seed, God's kingdom grows and grows from each small kindness we offer the world. God's kingdom grows here on earth every time we do our best to live within God's ways. Now, what about the yeast? Do you know what yeast is used for? Most often, yeast is used in baking bread. When you bake bread, you mix flour and water. Yeast is added to help the dough rise, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger before you even bake it. Without the yeast, mixing flour and water would still create bread, but it would be more flat, like a pancake, than the loaves of bread that you and I are used to. When yeast, small and seemingly insignificant, is added to the flour and to the water, the dough is changed and transformed into something that can feed many, many people. You see, when he told these two parables, Jesus was telling us, that what we do for God can and does make a big difference. Sometimes those things may seem small and ordinary, but it makes more difference than we will ever know. And I wonder what small thing you can do that might make a big difference in this world. I hope you'll think about that this week, the way that you can make a big difference in the world. Friends, let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for ordinary, common items that remind us that small things really do make a big difference. Help us find small ways to make a big difference in our world today. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. Listen for the word of the Lord to the church. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. 
It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Parables are magical things. They aren't necessarily just metaphors or even extended metaphors. What Jesus does when he tells a parable is to invite you into a world of his own making, to look around, to make note of the things that are strange and to find inside that world a truth about who God is, what the kingdom is, and about our place in God's kingdom. Depending on your point of view, you and I might hear different gospel truth from the parable, but our different interpretations will still be part of the same world that we both walked into. Recently, I've been playing around with my daughter's Rubik's Cube. You know that cube with the different colored blocks that you try to align all the colors together. And it kind of reminded me of these parables because you can hold it in your hand and spin the edges around and every spin brings a new alignment of colors to the forefront. That's how we're going to look at our parables today to look at the elements there and see how spinning them in different directions gives us a different perspective. So first is the foundational metaphor for so many of Jesus's parables, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God and some other gospels. Depending on what you think Jesus means when he says kingdom of heaven, makes all the difference of what you hear when you hear this parable. When I see the kingdom of heaven in the Gospels, the best way I know of to understand it is actually through something that we say together every week. The Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. That familiar prayer recognizes that God's kingdom comes wherever God's will is done. How do we know what that is? Well, we can't know in every situation, but in general, God's kingdom has a certain value system, we'll say, that is upside down and backwards from the value system of the world we live in. If you've been in any of my Bible studies, you may have heard me say that before. God's kingdom is upside down and backwards from the values of the world we live in. We see this all over in the Gospels. Things like money and wealth that are so important to our world are essentially worthless in God's kingdom unless they're being used to help others. Things like a good standing in society or a powerful position are kind of a waste of time in God's kingdom where the last is first. And the outcasts and the sinners get special attention. Jesus shows us through his own life that the kingdom of heaven is about things like healing and comforting and forgiveness, challenging injustice and preserving human dignity, especially for the desperate and the ignored members of society. If an inbreaking of the kingdom is like planting a seed or hiding some yeast in the flower, then we might think of those things broadly in concrete terms of acts of justice, mercy, and faithfulness, the three requirements from the prophet Micah. And what about that seed and that yeast? Well, I don't want to belabor this too much, but using these elements as examples might be somewhat surprising. A mustard bush is a fast-growing, sure, but also invasive kind of plant. It's unclear whether or not this is something that would be desirable to plant in a field, 
especially if they were hoping to plant other things along with it. And yeast, while it isn't an annoyance in itself, was commonly used in Jesus' day in metaphorical terms as a bad thing, a metaphor for a corrupting influence. Jesus elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel urges his followers to beware the yeast of the Pharisees. And Paul uses the metaphor in 1 Corinthians in a negative light too, saying, let us not celebrate the festival not with old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In other words, we might equate these metaphors with something like kudzu or a virus. This is surprising, but consistent with the kingdom of heaven in which the despised people of the world are lifted up as the very people through whom the kingdom comes. No one more so than Jesus. Then there is the burying of the seed and the hiding of the yeast in the flour. This is an act of trust. It takes the agent of change out of the planter's hand and turns it into, over to nature for it to do whatever it will. The growth of both plant and bread are out of the hands of the farmer and the baker. They initiate the action, but what happens with the seed or the yeast happens in secret, in the ground, in the dough. Finally, what comes out of these actions isn't just a big bush or a loaf of bread, but it's specifically provisions for others. In the end, we realize that the value of the mustard bush in the kingdom of heaven is as a nesting place for the birds, a place of security for those who rely on God's grace for everything. The bread is no different. What you might know, not know about three measures of flour is that it represents about 50 pounds of flour. The baker isn't making bread for herself or even just her family. This is enough to feed about 100 people. And we know that feeding hungry people is of high value in the kingdom of heaven. Now this probably isn't an exhaustive list of what's going on in these parables, but here are the elements we have. Something small, a seed and yeast, an invasive plant, and a metaphor that's often seen in a negative light, unlikely metaphors for something of value. Then exponential growth, not for the sake of the bush itself or the bread itself, not even for the benefit or of the farmer or the baker, but an end product to serve others. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. So here's the fun part. Now we have to think about what these things look like depending on where we stand. We might see it as onlookers of history. We see Jesus planting seeds of healing and grace amongst the lowly of his contemporaries. We see him hiding the yeast of mercy, justice, and faithfulness among his disciples and followers. But it grows from there to become a blessing that reaches around the world. Or maybe the early church itself is the seed or the yeast, a small, unimportant group that spreads throughout the Roman Empire with a message of equality and forgiveness of sins and a God who loves the lost and least of society. But we can look at it more personally, too. Those small moments of grace in our own lives, dropped into our own hearts like a seed folded into us, or like yeast. Someone who showed us what it was like to be forgiven, maybe unconditionally. Someone who went a little out of their way or took a special interest in us, planting a sense of self-worth and a belonging that we needed. Whatever those moments of grace planted in your life look like, 
Can you see where those things have helped you grow into the disciple that you are? The ways that you yourself have become useful in God's kingdom because someone once planted a seed of the kingdom with you. Or maybe we turn the picture yet again and see that we as disciples have our own seeds to plant and yeast to fold in to hide in the world around us. So we hear this parable calling us to wonder, what if I planted kindness over here? I wonder if it would grow into anything. What yeast do I have that might help the values of God's kingdom grow in the world around me? If I endeavor to be a peacemaker, will peace spread? If I take an interest in the lives of those who are desperate, what yeast or seed do I have to offer? What might it grow into? These are just some of the ways we can enter into the parable. It's the same parable, but aligning the parts from different perspectives brings us into the story in a different way. At the beginning, I talked about it like a Rubik's Cube because you can turn the pieces and align them in different ways to get a different mixture of color. But another thing about the Rubik's Cube is that the middle pieces of every color actually never change. They're static. And I think our parables do have a middle piece. That is the kingdom itself. No matter where we place ourselves in the parable, it will always be telling us that the kingdom of God, the example of Christ's life and his powerful self-giving love is something that changes the world. No matter how small the change agent is, and when it does change the world, we see the effects where creation is cared for like birds nesting in the shade, where people are fed with abundance. These are the signs of the kingdom come, of God's will being done. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Now, having heard the word, read and proclaimed, we together as the community of faith, state what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. And we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
to you in this time of prayer with old wounds and new hopes. We come to you bringing new anxieties and old dreams, yearning for new creation and for your vision. We look to you, O oh God, for guidance, for solace, for challenge, and for stamina. The paths we travel in this time feel treacherous and daunting. We want to know where you would have us go and how we can find Jesus's way no matter where you send us. We need to know your presence and that you are near to us. God of beginnings and endings, as the summer heat deepens and the pandemic continues, we ask for your wisdom. Do not let us give in to our fears, but instead inspire us with your spirit. Show us the new things you are right now doing so that we can participate in them. In all of the upheaval and pain, the loss and uncertainty, help us to see the places where this chaos is opening spaces for a better way of life together. Grant us the courage to not only see the cracks in the structures of our society, but the faith to repair them, so as to better build communities for all of your children. God of grace and of mercy, we know that with your power, mustard seed, mustard-sized seeds give way to majestic, nurturing trees, and unseen leaven produces more than enough bread to feed the world. We pray for those suffering in body, mind, or spirit. May our faith in you lead us to act in ways that make your relationship with us evident and our discipleship transformative for others. Confident that the Spirit intercedes for us in our weakness, we ask you to guide those in leadership positions making difficult decisions that will impact our children and parents, our neighbors and friends, our schools and communities. Give humility and insight to those in power. Give voice and strength to those who speak truth to power. 
and give relief and support to those with no power. We know, Lord of all, that nothing can separate us from your love, that through you all things are possible, that your grace is sufficient, and that your will for abundant life cannot be thwarted. We praise you for these gifts and pray that our lives will reflect their truth. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As usual, I have two questions for reflection for you from our sermon today. The first question is, can you think of a time in your own life when the kingdom of heaven came to you in a small way, like a mustard seed, but with a profound impact? And the second question, have you ever done something that you would consider as planting a seed for the kingdom, knowing that you might never see the results of your actions? or the impact that you had. And now as we prepare to close our worship service today, I leave you with the benediction that we always say at the end of our services from Philippians 4 verses 8 through 9. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you have learned and received and heard and seen, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. <laughs>